back to another video from HSTV and in today's video as you can see by the video title we're going to be going over ECGs. Now specifically this is the first part of a three part series. So today we're going to be going over basics as well as waveforming, really asking ourselves where does the ECG originate from? Now if you're new to the channel and you don't know who I am, my name is Heen Shamaz. I'm a fifth year medical student here at the University of Edinburgh and I remember a few months ago and a couple of years ago being very afraid of this pink sheet with squiggly lines on it. Now here's the thing right, as medical students we really need to believe ourselves a lot more so I made this series to try and teach you ECGs the way that I wish I'd been taught them. So stay tuned for these three parts and hopefully by the end of this you will feel a lot more confident in reading and understanding ECGs. Let's get into the first part. Alright everybody, so jumping right in, this part is going to be a good introduction to the ECG and we'll also be covering a bit of the cardiac cycle because I do think that they go hand in hand with ECG basics so hopefully this will be a nice little uh, tutorial for you. So, um, you know, starting on a very nice light note, the heart is one of the only, in fact it probably is the only organ that can actually speak to you in the sense of uh, the heartbeat and it can actually write to you in the form of the ECG and it can tell you exactly what's wrong with it but if we as medical students and as clinicians don't really understand it, uh, the language of the heart then we're going to be in a bit of trouble so you know this is how I wish I was taught ECGs and really why I put the series together so, I hope that you have seen a normal ECG. If you haven't, that's all right. I'm putting an example up here. This is a very standard normal ECG. This is uh, something that uh, hopefully, you know, for all of our healthy individuals, this is what it would look like. Um, very quickly covering some basics. So what you've got um, at the beginning here is this little calibrator. You don't need to worry too much about that. Um, normally the ECG is printed on a pink squared sheet of paper because these squares are indicating uh, quite important uh, time scales to us that we need to understand and the measurements here uh, really will dictate what's going on in the heart. You also have uh, these uh, numbering and these letters. So we've got leads one, two, and three. Then we've got the augmented leads here, AVR, ABL, and ABF. And then we have the chest leads from V1 through to V6. Um, hopefully on most ECGs that you'll see, this is the notation that is used. And then also normally at the top, you'll have some details about the patient and most ECG machines uh, nowadays will actually tell you what's wrong uh, in the ECG. However, do not always follow that. It's very important that you are able to understand the patterns uh, on your own as well. So, you know, if I had asked a five-year-old to describe to me what that ECG looked like, they'd probably say it's a bunch of squiggly lines going up and down. So, it is very important for us to understand when uh, the line is going up and when we have negative deflections as well. So to understand that, what you need to know is that these are, rep are representing some cardiac cells. So um, this is a very basic representation. We'll speak a little bit more about them and I've got a handout as well for how the action potential and how charges are uh, kind of passed on cell to cell. I'm not going to go into the details of that right now but what I want you to know is that when we have any charge um, kind of an, uh, an action potential, we've got a burst of energy produced at uh, any one cell, that charge is passed throughout the heart and th this is really what helps the heart to contract and um, you know fulfill its function. Now, in an ECG, essentially, we are just measuring the heart's um, conducting abilities and really looking at the directions of these charges and where these charges are going. So if we wanted to have a circuit where, you know, we've got the heart in the middle, let's say, and we've got a negative electrode and a positive electrode um, measuring the charge between them, then this is what would happen. So if we have a positive charge being produced and passed on cell to cell towards our positive electrode, wherever it is that we've placed it, we will get a positive deflection shown on the ECG paper. 
Likewise, if we then have a positive charge traveling towards a negative electrode, we would be resulting in a negative deflection on the ECG paper. Now, interestingly, if we have the heart in the middle again, you know, I want you to imagine this, and we have a positive charge traveling perpendicular to where our circuit is measuring from, then we will be left with a straight line, or you might hear it as an isometric line on the ECG. Now, I know we don't really, uh, we're not very fond of physics in medicine, but I do think if you want to have a good understanding of the ECG, this is something really quite basic that you should understand. Now, a note here, and something that will become quite relevant, is, you know, if we've got a positive charge travelling to a positive, you get a positive deflection. But remember that if you have a negative charge travelling towards a negative electrode, you will also get a positive deflection. So, positive to positive, if it matches up, it's a positive deflection. But also negative to negative, if it matches up, then you have a ne um, positive deflection as well, not a negative deflection, okay? So if your electrode and your charge differs, it's a negative deflection, okay? So that's a little bit of confusing physics out of the way. Now, the initiation of the action potential, it actually starts at the sinoatrial node. And the sinoatrial node is this little region of the heart in the right atria. And the very cool thing is that the heart is myogenic, meaning it really uh, produces its own action potentials. It doesn't need any input from the brain as such. And it's also spontaneous, so it kind of does it when it wants to. It kind of has its mind of its own, which is a bit scary if you think about it. But, you know, the heart has been beating since, um, you know, before birth all the way up until we pass away. So this is really quite a miracle. I hope you agree. Now, this is the handout I was talking about. So if you are interested in learning more about how an action potential actually um, passes through cell to cell, that is all going to be in this excitation contraction coupling handout. If you'd like a whole lecture of me explaining this as well, do let me know down in the comments and I'm sure we can uh, sort that out. So, Going back to the normal ECG, there is one lead in particular that we are going to focus our energy to. You'll see this a lot in textbooks as well. Our favourite lead is lead two. And the reason lead two is our favourite is because it's actually measuring the electrical activity in the heart, putting an, a negative electrode on the top right hand side and then a positive electrode at the bottom left hand side. Now remember your orientation, this is the right side of the heart and this is the left side of the heart. It can become confusing uh, so just keep that in mind. But really because of the way the heart is situated inside the body and the way our charges travel through the heart, that is why lead two is our most favourite because it's actually measuring the activity directly in the direction of how charges pass through. So that is why we will be focusing on lead two and we're going to be imagining our two electrodes that are placed uh, on either side of the heart. Now the first thing that you need to understand is this term called atrial depolarization. Now, atrial depolarization is when at the sinoatrial node we have this spontaneous action potential, this um, positive charge that is produced. And as that positive charge runs through the right atria, we get the P wave. Now, remember, why? If why are we actually getting a positive deflection? Well, it's because we've got a positive charge, a, lots of positive charges, travelling in the direction of our positive electrode. And remember, positive to positive means an upward deflection. And that is what we call the P wave. Atrial depolarization, it's in the name. This is all about the atria becoming positively charged. Okay, so once we have the sinoatrial node producing this action potential and this wave 
of positive charges running through the atria, we then get to this uh, another region called the atrioventricular node. Now, the atrioventricular node does a very strange thing here. It actually holds these positive charges just for a few milliseconds. And when we have no movement in charge, we get a straight line, which is called our PR segment. So that distance from the start of the P wave all the way to the end of the PR segment is called your PR interval. This is all going to be quite important when we're talking about different rhythms. And we have uh, the PR segment. This is all about the atrioventricular node holding those positive charges just for a few milliseconds, causing a slight delay before we get onto ventricular depolarization. So before that positive charge travels through this thick muscle in the ventricle, we're going to hold it there just for a few milliseconds. Now, what's actually happening in the heart? Because I sometimes think that ECGs can be confusing because it's just all about charges and electrodes and electrical conductivity, which we can't visualize as such. So if you looked at the heart um, during um, this atrial depolarization process, what you would actually see is atrioventricular diastole. Now what that means is the ventricles are filling up with blood. Um, now I've obviously drawn this green, blood is not green, <laughs> um, but where it would be coming from is the vena cava, so that would be deoxygenated blood coming back from the rest of the body, coming into the right ventricle, and into the left ventricle we'd have the blood coming in from the pulmonary veins back from the lungs where it's been oxygenated. So remember the pulmonary veins are the only veins in the body that carry oxygenated blood, okay? Just remember that little fact because uh, it can be confusing. Anyways, veins bringing blood back into the heart, so vena cava bringing in the deoxygenated blood and the pulmonary veins bringing in the oxygenated blood. Now for that blood to come in through into the ventricles, we need our tricuspid and mitral valves open. So your tricuspid valve is this one here between the right uh, atria and ventricle, and your mitral valve is the one between your left atria and ventricle. And at the moment, there's not much use for the aortic and pulmonary valve, so they are going to remain closed for us, but we'll keep them in mind because they're going to become important later on. So while we're getting the P wave sorted, this is what's actually happening in the heart. Okay. Moving back to the ECG wave. Now, what's happening after um, we have this action potential generated, positive charge coming in through the atria into the atrioventricular node and it's been held there for a few milliseconds. After that, we get the positive charge coming through to the septum. Now the septum of the heart is this bit of muscle between the left and the right side of the heart. And this is striated muscle, so it's not muscle that's pointing downwards as such, it's kind of in layers. And because of this, some of that charge is actually traveling up the way. I know it's not represented very well in this diagram, but just take my word for it that as we are depolarizing the septum, that charge isn't all moving down the way, it's sort of moving horizontally. And because of that, we actually get a slight downward deflection, okay? Right, now, Again, thinking about what's happening actually inside the heart, if we looked at the heart, we are getting early ventricular systole. Now, what that means is that the ventricles are beginning to contract and we're trying to squeeze that blood up the way because ultimately we want to get it out to the rest of the body through our aorta and we also want the deoxygenated stuff to get to the lungs to become oxygenated. So we're aiming our energy, trying to get it up through the aorta and the pulmonary artery. 
Now, during this time, you'll actually hear the first heart sound. Now, the heart sounds are when the valves close. So the first heart sound is when your tricuspid valve and your mitral valve has closed. We get this lub sound, and then we get the aortic and pulmonary valves also closed at this time. Now, obviously, all of this is happening very quickly, and you know, with your heartbeat, you get this quick boom, 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 right? Um, it's kind of a little bit difficult sometimes to actually differentiate between the first and the second heart sound, but that is where you're hearing the first lub and at the moment all our valves are closed. Remember valves are not like um, doors, uh, like automatic doors that just open and close. They will open and close depending on the pressure of the blood. Okay so at the moment the valves have no pressure on them so they are closed. Okay Moving back onto the main event then, we're actually going to get ventricular depolarization now. So, recapping very quickly, we've got the action potential being initiated at the sinoatrial node, positive charge running through to the atrioventricular node, holding the charge there for a few milliseconds, and then we get uh, we, uh, septal depolarization. And as that positive charge now travels through to the ventricles, and we've got this big positive charge traveling through the bundle of His. Now the bundle of His, it's not a structure that you can visualize, but it's kind of like conduction wires. That's the way I like to think of it. We get this large positive conduction towards the positive electrode. And we know from our physics knowledge that anytime we get positive going towards a positive electrode, we get a big upward deflection. And in this case, it is called the R wave. Now, in the heart at this point, we're going to get mid to late ventricular systole. So we get ventricular ejection. This is now really where the ventricles have contracted and that blood that was sitting in the ventricles is now traveling up through our aortic valve, through to the aorta, and through our pulmonary valve to our pulmonary arteries to the lungs. And in this case, now the tricuspid mitral valves, they have been closed for a while, and it's time for the aortic and pulmonary valves to open. So that is what's actually happening uh, in the cardiac cycle side of things. And here you can see that we are representing the R wave. Okay, back to the ECG then, we are getting complete ventricular depolarization. So as you can see, once we've got this charge, inside our um, ventricle here, this positive charge is actually sitting there just for um, a few milliseconds. And because obviously we've got to depolarize um, this part of the muscle, we've got some of that positive charge traveling up the way. And we know that when we get positive charge traveling towards a negative electrode, we get a downward deflection. And that's really what this S wave is representing. Uh, once we've depolarized the entire ventricle, we get this ST segment, because this is where our charge is being held just for a few milliseconds. Okay, now here is probably the most confusing part of the ECG, the T wave. To understand where that's coming from, we need to know about ventricular repolarization. So what happens here is the uh, cardiac muscle cells, they need to return to resting membrane potential. So if we want cardiac uh, cells to be able to depolarize again and run through that cycle again, we need them to calm back down to their resting phase, their resting membrane potential, which is a negative potential. It's actually around about negative 90 millivolts. And when we have everything now suddenly flipping to a negative charge, we know that if we have negative charges traveling towards a negative electrode, we will be getting a positive deflection. Okay, remember, positive charge to a positive electrode, positive deflection, negative charge to a negative electrode, 
also a positive deflection. So just remember that in order for our cardiac muscle tissue to depolarize again, it has to repolarize, it has to go back to its resting membrane potential, and that means it needs to go from positive to negative, so it gets back to its resting phase, and during that process, we have got this T wave being formed. Okay, actually what's happening in the heart then? Ventricular diastole, okay? So the ventricles are now relaxed, they've had this big contraction, your coronary arteries are now perfused, so the heart has got its own blood supply sorted, your tricuspid and your mitral valves, they are now closed, your aortic and your pulmonary valves are also now closed, so that is why we get the second heart sound, making a dub sound, so we've now had the lub sound, which was the original tricuspid and mitral valves closing, and now we get the second heart sound, dub when the aortic and pulmonary valve have also closed. And remember that that blood, as well as going to the coronary arteries, has also travelled through the aorta to the rest of the body and also through the pulmonary arteries to the lungs to get oxygenated. Now, this is your waveform summary. If you want to take a screenshot or, um, you know, pause here and just review things, this is a good stage to do so very quickly the p wave is representing atrial depolarization so the action potential at the sinoatrial node has been produced and a positive charge traveling towards the positive electrode produces an upward deflection the pr segment is really where the charge is being held at the atrioventricular node as we move down into the septum, the septum also becomes depolarized and we get a slight negative deflection because we've got somewhat of a horizontal depolarization happening. So we get a slight downward deflection. Then we've got the main event, our R wave, which is representative of ventricular depolarization. This is when the positive charges in the heart are traveling to the ventricles, big positive energy towards the positive electrode. As the heart is sort of getting back down um, and coming into its um, ventricular repolarization, and as it completely becomes depolarized, we've got this bit of um, S wave happening and the ST segment where the heart is moving some of that positive uh, charge up towards the negative electrode, meaning we get slight downward deflection and a slight pause uh, before we move into ventricular repolarization, where all the charges are now coming back down to resting membrane potential, which is about negative 90 millivolts. And because we have negative charges traveling towards a negative electrode, we get a positive deflection. So you've got PR interval, PR segment, ST segment, and we also have the QT interval. These segments and intervals are going to become quite important when we are talking about different arrhythmias, so it's good to have them labelled now. In terms of your summary for your cardiac cycle, again, if you want to take a screenshot or have a look over this and just pause the video here, you can also do so. So remember, we've got um, our kind of uh, diastole, we've got early ventricular systole, we've got mid to late ventricular systole, and then we've got ventricular diastole. And throughout that, you want to remember that the heart sounds come from valves closing. So when we get into early ventricular systole and your tricuspid and your mitral valves close from being open, you get a lub sound. And then later on, as part of ventricular diastole, when your aortic and pulmonary valves go from open to close, you get the second heart sound being dub. And you can see how this correlates to the ECG waveform. I hope that this summary can help um, get things straight in your head. So, 
this is your other key points in regards to the cardiac cycle. Again, I know this is an ECG series, but these are quite important concepts and I, I quite like putting summaries together, so I put this together as well. So remember, your stroke volume is the volume of blood that's pumped by each ventricle per beat. Your cardiac output is the volume of blood pumped out each minute by each ventricle. So that's your stroke volume times your heart rate. We're gonna be talking a lot more about heart rate in your later parts. Ejection fraction, it's something that you hear a lot about when you are speaking um, about heart failure patients and um, you might hear you know, an ejection fraction of 35% could be uh, somebody who's perhaps had a heart attack and then their heart is failing. And this is really telling us the percentage of volume of blood pumped out. So your normal is about 55 to 60%. However, as I said, someone who might be going through heart failure might have something like 35%. Gives us an idea of the heart's function. Your end diastolic volume, well, that's quite easy because that's just the volume of blood in each ventricle at the end of diastole. Now the concepts of preload and afterload, um, I could probably make a whole video on this, but really I want you to think of these as forces in the heart. So your preload is the amount of stretch in the ventricles during diastole, and your afterload is the amount of resistance that the heart wants to pump against when it's ejecting blood. Now, this is really where the Frank Starling mechanism comes in. Again, you know, if you're a beginner, please go watch a different video on this, but as a summary, when you have um, higher filling pressures stretching the heart, you need higher force of contraction in the heart. That higher force of contraction is going to expel more blood from the left ventricle so that your cardiac output is raised and from that your preload also becomes raised. So that is a quick summary on the cardiac cycle. But yeah, that is all for today's part. I know we've covered a lot there. We've covered the ECG waveform and we also covered cardiac cycle in there as well. Let me know if you have any questions and yeah. All right, everybody, well, that is gonna be the end of this video. I hope that this has been useful. Uh, I know it was probably a lot of information thrown at you, but if you have any questions or anything you're not too sure about, leave it down in the comments or email me or DM me, whatever is easiest for you. And I hope that as a community together, we can become ECG superheroes. Now, make sure you stay tuned for parts two and three coming soon as well. They might already even be here, in which case I'll link it up there, um, where we will be going over how to read ECGs, looking at reading algorithms, as well as common arrhythmias likely to come up in your exams. So, lots to look forward to, and yeah, I'll see you all in my next video. Goodbye.